out there in the world. And I'm, I'm Rob, obviously. I'm Carrie. Um, thank you again so much for having us. So uh, I guess just to start, the name of our presentation is It's the Building, Not the Building, which, which really is the title for a, uh, oh, let's, why don't we get the thing up? There we go. Can you all see that there? Okay. So the title uh, of the presentation is it's the, it's the Building, Not the Building, which really uh, ended up being, <clears throat> it's the title for a piece that we, we made for the first exhibition uh, in the new Asheville Museum of Art uh, in downtown Asheville for a show called Appalachian Now. And as people have chosen to live in our lives in the world of architecture and craft and design, we decided when we're invited to do a, an art installation, why not make a, a, a motivational risograph art poster that people can grab and take with them. So the phrase, it's the building, not the building, has really been a kind of de facto mantra in our studio through the years as we've grown from just the two of us as practitioners to really a, a, a four or five person design studio. And what it, what it means to us really kind of harkens back to the, the poster itself, which you can speak to. Yeah, later. yeah, it starts with um, get ready. So lay out your batter boards in the right place with the right people. So that concept being that um, whatever you do, just find the right place and find some good people and, um, and that will lead to better outcomes. Um, so make it right, make a plan and delegate. Um, know the path forward, but be ready for compromise. Uh, no wall is truly plumb and no floor is truly level. So we're setting ourselves up to do um, the right thing and, and, and make something that we can be proud of, but also knowing that there's no one perfect right way for that to work out. Break for lunch, always <laughs> break for lunch. Be, be, you know, this, this practice can, if you let it, it can be, it can be all consuming and rough <laughs> on your person and psyche. So remember that you live in the world and uh, engage in that. And I love just being a human who takes a walk when you need to stop uh, working for a minute and get back to work when you do. And finally, the last bit is a uh, wet the bow, which is a, a construction term uh, for putting a fresh sprig of spruce on the topmost part of a framed structure, kind of in celebration of the material that you made the house with and the process that you took to get there. And above all, just like being thankful for, for the making itself. And, and basically after you've made it, make it, let it go, because it's gonna live a life of its own. And ultimately everything kind of falls apart anyway. So just remember to love the process and be respectful of the process. So really at the end of a, at the end of this kind of concept is that it's it's all about the making. It's the building, not the building. The artifacts you make are important. And, uh, but, but at the end, they kind of are just that. They're artifacts of a life you've lived and a design process that you've taken to get there. Uh, and kind of to that end, how did, how did we get there? So uh, we met at a little design build school in Vermont called Yes Tomorrow Design Build School. And this picture here is, is miraculously, I think one of the first times that Carrie and I ever spoke. And it's in the middle of a timber frame uh, workshop. We're cutting the impossible joint for rafter plate. Um, and for me, I had been working, uh, I went to Tulane and got my master's and I moved to New York and I was working in architectural firms just working on a variety of stuff from retail, residential, to you know, doing some competition work for the firm that I was with. And I learned that I loved architecture, but I really wanted to learn more about how things were made before I, I kind of spent too much time behind the computer. And yestermorrow was the place that I really found myself and the ability to pursue the, the process of design through my hands. And I, I ended up going to um, school for studio art and I'd always intended to go to architecture school, but when it came time, I just, I felt like I needed more space for craft and um, for art and for design to intertwine somehow. Um, so I went to school for studio art. I ended up working in um, arts nonprofits and environmental design nonprofits. Traveled a lot. I traveled quite a few places and um, 
learn natural building and um, met a lot of interesting people. And one of my last stops was um, at this environmental education center in Costa Rica. And I met some folks that had been to Yes Tomorrow and told me about it. And um, I applied and that's how I ended up in Vermont where I met Rob. I mean, I do think we have to mention that Yes Tomorrow is kind of a, it's a, it's a funny name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, a pretty bad name. It's, it's an amazing place really. And so, so Yes Tomorrow uh, as a place is, it, yes Tomorrow is really spawned from uh, a community of designers and builders that are kind of a, a splinter lineage of architectural history. They're people who went to architecture school in the 60s and 70s, and some of them decided to kind of drop out, go up to Vermont and make their own essentially design build world. Uh, these two projects here are examples of some of the structures that you'd find up in this place, uh, up in Vermont, in the valley that Yes Tomorrow uh, is situated in. And what was really exciting about, uh, to the more to the point, I guess that from the second generation of people who built these structures as a whole community of houses like this in Wilder out there, there came a design build ethos for design build, not as a business model, but as a, a kind of like a life practice and a design practice. So these are people who are designing, truly designing on a napkin, what they were gonna build after lunch. And uh, I think that because of that design build as a, as a practice and an ethos, there were people who were forced to be generalists because they weren't subbing out everything to plumbers and electricians and engineers to design their like wind powered composting toilet. <laughs> They had to, they were doing it themselves. So they had to learn how to do it and learn how it worked. And therefore just design started encompassing all aspects of the way that they lived. And for us, for me in particular, like that was something that was so exciting because traditional architecture school practice as I knew it from you know early 2000s when I went to school is there was certain names that were important and certain projects that were important. And if it wasn't part of that canon, it wasn't important to architecture. And going to Yes Tomorrow was really kind of the first time that I got my eyes open to like, oh, you can make it up out of whole cloth and do it however you want. And it can be jankety and it can still be really, really beautiful and cool and feel really alive. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I think I came from it, came to it from this other side of like everything being wide open and free form and, and focus on an art practice and being able to, to move that into an architectural space was exactly what I was looking for. So we, 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 we came to this one point at, at, from really different kinds of places. And I think that really with us meeting and deciding that A, we wanted to hang out as people and B, that we both really liked designing and making things, uh, we kind of decided that we were gonna be our own generalists of sorts, partially out of desire to and partially out of necessity because we we're young and figuring out what we were doing and we're building a practice. And one of the first things that came kind of in, came into our, our purview was, Immediately after Yes Tomorrow, we got uh, along with our friend and co-builder, Jesse Cooper, who's up there in the roof in the green jacket. Uh, we got a project uh, designing and building a timber frame cabin uh, about a half mile off of a basically roadhead in Northern New Hampshire. And we moved out there to the property, lived in an uninsulated, partially, partially finished garage, camped on site and cut everything in a garage and then hauled it all the way out to this job site, which was like half mile in the woods and over two streams and up maybe a 40 or 50 foot vertical rise to build this little kind of cabin folly uh, in timber frame format for this client. And we did everything from like the picture on the bottom right is we hand dug the foundation dug gravel from that stream, filled the gravel into the holes, rolled stones down the hill, used a cold chisel to manually make a set pin for the foundation supports to rest on, and then hauled out this you know, giant 18 foot long eight by eight timbers with a group of friends using cut logs from the site, and then a winch to crank it up the <laughs> hill to have a timber frame raising 
out in the middle of the woods. And although, you know, I think our aesthetics were not totally in the, you know, we're not in the pagoda village necessarily anymore, but that project was just so, such an amazing opportunity to experience all aspects of the design and construction process and also see how really it was a lifestyle and we had to be generalists to make it work. We had to, you know, know how to make a camp and cook our food as well as how to determine what you needed to haul up this giant log onto the this promontory with. So that was kind of the first, wow, we can be generalists and wow, you can make your own life for yourself. And it can be really fun. It's not exactly the most financially successful project we've ever had, but the best things in life aren't generally. So uh, it was just a really wonderful experience. It kind of sent us on our way. And at the end of that project, we lived there for until November uh, and it started snowing in New Hampshire. And that's when we decided we needed to get out of New Hampshire and found our way to Asheville, North Carolina. So, boop, boop. <laughs> So um, we had a series of different studios in Asheville and one of our, our most recent ones, not the one that we're in right now, but um, the, the one that really sort of transformed our practice was a little space that I could see sitting at this one stoplight on my way home. Um, on my way home. So I would always look at the space and it was a cobbler, one of the last cobblers left in, in Asheville. And he had a huge plastic Virgin Mary in the window. And one day the Virgin Mary was gone and I realized that he was leaving the space and I was bummed about that, but I also was really excited about the space opening up. So I pulled over and we signed that le the lease that day. And the intention was that it would be just a studio, um, but it was a little retail space and it was cute. <coughs> and um, I made objects, Rob and I both made things. You know, we, we tried out woodworking and, and worked in textiles and, and all sorts of things. So we were like, well, maybe if there's so many craftspeople in the Asheville area, why don't we open up a store and we can design that space? So um, we, we spent a couple months uh, dedicated to building the space out outside of work and, um, and uh, sold a lot of different work from different craftspeople in the area, which wasn't something we really knew about Asheville when we moved here. M my background is, my mom was a crafter, but in more of the like 80s sort of sense. And um, I, I loved, I always considered myself somebody that was a craftsperson, but I didn't really understand that rich history here. So uh, when we moved here, I realized there were all sorts of people that were, were looking at craft in a different sort of way. And, and we were interested in, in taking that work and putting it in a different context rather than that like kind of like studio craft, um, older school way of looking at it. I realized there was a whole world of modern craft happening, particularly here. Yeah, it was it was an early period for both, quite honestly, to, to talk about kind of digital aspects of it, Instagram and Etsy, mm -hmm. were where there was kind of this new like craft resurgence that was representing traditional crafts in a new way and finding broader markets outside of just craft fairs and local markets. And there's a few people that are from this kind of early iteration of craft that have now become bigger brands that we've kind of partnered with over the years. But this really was our first foray into the craft traditions of Western North Carolina, which are, are really deep and varied, which is really exciting. And one of the venues that kind of discovered us from us making this presentation of contemporary craft in the form of a retail space was this organization called the Center for Craft, which is an organization downtown that's dedicated to the promotion of crafts and grant writing and contemporary craft on a national scale. And they had a gallery space uh, that they had just renovated and we're having uh, an exhibition that they were entitling Made in WNC. And it was about the kind of history of craft in the area and what the craft future would be. Uh, you know, this is 2016 or something of the like. Um, and we're earlier, 2014. <laughs> uh, they asked us to come on board to make an exhibition for this space. So, 
in one of the things that had happened while we were uh, before this had actually come to fruition was that we had been engaged doing some photo production for editorial work for a brand, Pointer brand, which is based in Tennessee, kind of a heritage menswear, the brand that's been in Bristol, Tennessee for the past hundred years. And in their old warehouse factory were all these really cool old crates um, that were shipping crates for uh, various fabric and textile providers, yarns, et cetera. So on the left-hand side, you can see Americana Yarn and Processing Company, Mont Holly, North Carolina. So these were all the crates that were used to ship all these old textiles to Bristol, Tennessee, that usually used for the production of pointer brand jackets and workwear. And they said, you can have some of these. And that kind of sparked a, a concept of crates as a means of transportation of crafted goods, crates as a means of a vessel that holds information to be transported. And that loose concept turned into the idea of taking the form of a crate and abstracting it into a series of kind of planes and, and vectors, which becomes boards and vertical stick elements. And those would become the structure that we would then use to house the 27 different craft crafters and makers that were going to be part of this show and they would be organized into individual uh, clusters based on lifestyle or means of production and each of these kind of abstracted crates that some of them had some of these panels that I, I mentioned on them would become the means of kind of visual and physical storytelling to display and portray craft and the history of craft and where it was going in the future so and because we're journalists and young and foolish, this was me like making it in the basement of the Center for Craft. And then ultimately this was like one shot of the show that just depicts how this all kind of sort of Garrett Griefeld lands in the space and these uh, four abstracted crates that portray a variety of different makers who are people in the area that were exploring craft traditions. And Ultimately, the show got asked to go to uh, Wanted Design for uh, Design Week in New York City. So we, we brought it up there, which was really exciting. So what are we going next here? So through that work with the retail space, we um, somebody who lived in Portland, Oregon, saw our work and um, had just purchased this old beautiful building in um, the furthest northeast corner of Oregon. And um, he was turning that into a small hotel where we'd ask different designers to design each room out. And so he reached out to us to see if he would design one of those spaces and ultimately the space that was um, an, an, for an artist residency. Um, so this space is one of the larger spaces. There's a, a, a kitchenette, a, a dining area, a living room, and a, a bedroom and, and space to also work whatever that person's medium was. So um, we made these drawings and we redesigned the whole space. So it was a, an approach that, that took into account where the actual walls of the space were. So we got to, to gut, fully gut the space. Um, the, we, we like to take a lot of projects that have really tiny budgets and really big budgets. It's really good for the brain to, to work within those different parameters. This had a really small budget. So we actually made a bunch of the things here. Um, we, we went out there and we helped um, build out these uh, built-in benches. And um, I designed and made this quilt. Rob designed and made this organizer. And we also designed and sewed these um, the, the upholstery for the built-in. That, that project was a, a, one of the first ones that kind of felt like a, a really good primer for how we like to work and try to work for all of our projects, which is, it's a kind of, it spans architecture and interiors and craft where we get to not only design the physical spaces, create architectural drawings, but also actually make some of the elements in the space and or work with local craftspeople to, to get custom pieces made. Like wherever we go, that's not always, not always an option, but it's something we try for. Because I think that that ability to create something both physically and in the objects itself that you can't just find anywhere makes 
something special. So as an artist residency, it felt like a really cool opportunity to make just something that had a few elements that were custom that only lived in this space. And I think as part of that thinking of the ability to make our own things, uh, which is kind of like our art practice as an art, interiors and architecture practice as an art practice, something that we try to do for ourselves and we've been really lucky to be able to do is to kind of veer off to the side on side spurs of our travels and take on residencies or experiences that feel like they're totally outside of the traditional trajectory of an interior studio or an architecture studio. Uh, so this is something that we've done. We've both uh, we've been able to take residencies, but as, as well as teach uh, at this location, which is the Penland School of Crafts in Penland, North Carolina, which is an amazing resource for people interested in craft uh, of all sorts. Uh, but this was just a residency that we were able to do during their winter downtime, where although we're an interiors architecture studio, we decided that we were going to take a week and learn how to emboss leather emboss letter press leather. Uh, I don't know where that's going to turn up in any of our <laughs> projects. It hasn't necessarily yet, but you never know. And I think that any opportunity you have to kind of work totally off in a different direction for at least a minute is just a good shock to the brain to remember that uh, all the stuff that we do is fun and exciting and that there's a lot of different ways to find new inspiration. Um, these are two other examples. Yeah, we did not we did not design and build the <laughs> the building on the left, but um, but I, I feel like through our whole our whole practice and um, studio experience, yeah, the people that we met at Yes Tomorrow have really continued to come back um, into our lives and shape part of our shape our lives. So this building on the left was designed by Dave Sellers, who was a a, a Yes Tomorrow counter um like teacher and part of founding one parent. of the founding people related to yes tomorrow but uh this is the gazoontite institute in west virginia um which patch adam started for um people in that area who don't have you know easy access to hospitals and doctors so a friend of ours was working on this project um, who we met in vermont and so we went up there for a few days and uh, helped build a bunch of these little dormers over the windows. So it was just a, a really beautiful experience um, to, to be able to do that and to find time to carve out outside of work to, to go up and, and donate this time to this project. And then the, the image on the right is actually part of an ongoing relationship with Yes Tomorrow. We've been, we've been lucky for the past nine years, save for this last summer because of COVID, to go up and co-teach one of the home design build courses that they run up there every summer, which is a really fun and interesting crash course in kind of the freshman year of architecture for people who have never picked up a pencil before. And they design, uh, learn to draft, design their own home, as well as we design and build a project for the community in the area in Vermont. So this is an example of we designed and built out of rust on lumber from a local sawmill, a clay structure for a local uh, elementary school. So it was preemptively designed to house a green roof from the next class. And I think if I tried to walk in there, my head would get knocked off. So it's actually very small. <laughs> but uh, I find that those kinds of opportunities to, again, just work in something outside of your prescribed field for a minute in a, or work in it in a different way is always exciting and a good refresher to remember why you do it, that it's about doing it in the first place as opposed to getting too bogged down in a finished schedule or an RCP. Um, this project in our early days as a studio, we did do a fair amount of exhibition design work, uh, primarily uh, trade booths. This is an exhibition or trade booth for a, a local analog synthesizer company that's here in Asheville called Make Noise Music, which is these amazing devices, which you can see on the upper left hand corner. Um, so the parameters of this project was that it needed to transport flat pack 
It needed to be inexpensive. It needed to go together with no mechanical fastening because at the, at the other end of things in California where this was heading to LA, uh, if you brought a drill out of a bag, all of a sudden it became a union labor job and it turned into a whole different ball of wax. No, no disregard to union labor, but just it made things a lot more complicated. So the whole idea was that this would just be something that came and unfolded on site. So this was our, our kind of first foray into just using another craft tradition, which is CNC routing technology, which we found a guy with an 18 foot long CNC bed on the literal top of a mountain in wow. Madison County, uh, shockingly remote for this huge, huge CNC bed. And he worked with artists and actually really well-renowned artists of national repute to do custom pieces. And we just luckily snuck in to get him to cut these flat pack sheets that all these were just display tables for these really beautiful synthesizers that all just pulled out of a box and unfolded and the, slide, the, the, the horizontal elements just slid in and locked into place. So that was a really fun project in the sense of being able to learn a new making technique, which was CNC machine work. So one of our first uh, retail projects was um, East Fork Pottery, which is a ceramic company based here in Asheville. And they were, they had just started um, making uh, more mass produced um, tableware. And they opened their first little flagship store in Asheville and reached out to us to, um, to design and build that space. So we had, we, we started out selling their work at our, store um, and we had done some other work for them like styling and art art uh, direction for a few photo shoots and then moved into making this first store for them and this was a cool process of our first foray into working with our furniture maker and craft make maker friends to start making uh, custom pieces that were related to a brand's identity so in this first project with East Fork, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it was that East Fork was about as a brand and how the materials would, rep would represent them. A and then be able to make unique pieces that could be kind of sturdy, timeless, made of solid natural materials, and ultimately just be a nice, quiet, but sophisticated backdrop for their plates. And I think that that kind of process of working with craft and also crafting a physical narrative that relates to a brand uh, is a really big part of our work. And that's something that turns up in commercial work, hospitality work, all sorts of things where you're trying to create an experience that relates to a, a, a brand's physical identity. Um, so in addition to art direction for East Fork, we, we've done some other art direction and, and story producing for or production for magazines um, and other brands. So one project we did was for a magazine called Collective Quarterly, and we produced a story about craftspeople in Western North Carolina um, in partnership with Pointer Brand. So um, we got to work with all these different different people and visit their studios and um, photograph their processes. Uh, again, like, well, you know, I think you might be seeing a theme in our generalist <laughs> tendencies is that it's, it's never just one thing. Uh, I think when we get to bog down in one particular way of being, we're like, you know what, let's do, let's create something else that is entirely different from what we do normally. So we decided we were gonna make a line of incense burners. Uh, which were based on geodesic domes just because we think that's such a cool shape. And we had the dome, the first that we designed it, uh, had it designed in, in Rhino, then it had it 3D printed, and then worked with a local ceramic, a slip cast ceramic outfit that makes molds for casting uh, to develop a mold and then develop colorways, and then work with a local graphic designer and uh, artist to make a brand identity and make a web page. And then work with a photographer friend who does uh, really beautiful editorial work to and product photography as well. Sorry, to uh, make kind of a, a fun ad campaign for this line of incense burners that I think we sold for like a year 
and a yeah. half, if that. <laughs> um, but it was it was just a really fun way of being like, okay, design is it's all this, it's all one taste, it's all the same process. What does it look like when you're applying it to making an item for sale versus making an item for inhabitation? Um, and we learned a lot about probably commercial production and what you can and can't do easily and why things may be structured as they are, uh, for better or for worse. But uh, at the end of the day, it was just a really fun excuse to make a really fun, small non sequitur that we still give out to friends and family on holidays. Yeah, and it was also, at this point, we were in the midst of a really big project, which we'll get to shortly, but um, we had been working so intensively with clients one-on-one -on -one that we just really needed to be our own client for a minute and just come up with what we wanted and do whatever we wanted <coughs> um, within, you know, particular limits, within particular limitations. Um, so it was, it was really, it was like a, a massage for the brain, just getting space from constantly needing to be um, like serving or, or being a service to, to others. So um, the project that we were working on at that time um, was a, a three house, basically compound in Martha's Vineyard. Um, so mainly the interiors for these projects, we also got to make a lot of custom furniture and lighting fixtures. Um, this is one of the houses that is, is a residence and the two others, one is a guest house and one is actually a, a retreat center. Um, so this was, this was the main house and this is the house that, that the, the owners would be living in um, the most. So we were looking at, um, you know, making it feel like their home, but in a, in a different kind of way and bringing in as many craftspeople as possible, not only from this region, but also from Martha's Vineyard. So whenever we do a project elsewhere, we really um, research and try to find who is there that we can work with. Um, because something else we've found related to craft that is really important um, in our practice is thinking about the story and history of objects. And the more that there's some kind of story imbued in each object, the more that that owner or um, the company or whoever it is that you're working with will love it and appreciate it and hold on to it, which um, I think it's so important in the interiors world to pay attention to how much trash is created. So we're really trying to create something and work with a client so that they love it and then they want to hold on to it for a really long time. And at the end of the day, all of the materials we're using as much as possible are as close to their natural state as they can be. Yeah, to that point, we've been lucky in that a lot of our there's a few of our projects, as in all things, that they've come into existence and then the brand has gone out of existence. And I, there's at least two that come to mind where all the materials and those have now gone on to live two other lives in other places, mm -hmm. whether it's a private residence or in a new brand's location. And that feels really good to know that it doesn't just go in the trash, that it actually can live multiple lives because it's, ma it's made well enough and people feel that and understand that enough to want to hold on. So this project um, was our first experience with designing lighting um, and that we worked with a company based in Long Island um, and we also designed this uh, white oak kitchen island and uh, a, a person actually that we met in, in Vermont, he ended up fabricating that. These are the, the finished lighting fixtures. So they're all walnut and white oak. Um, so this is the part of the retreat center and um, they also hold, they have a woodworking studio and they hold different kinds of classes for crafts um, like ceramics, textiles. So for each of the rooms in this space, we designed and had made um, different quilts and pillows. So we designed um, this quilt and pillow, had someone here locally make it um, this chair is from somebody in North Carolina. In this space, uh, we worked with a woman out of Portland, Oregon, um, named Mary Alaska, to make this custom mobile in front of this fireplace. Um, here are some other textiles that we worked on in the space. So 
different quilts, um, curtains. We worked with a, a craftswoman in Los Angeles named um, Nikki Sukamoto and a craftsperson in Martha's Vineyard who made this custom bed frame. And I think at the end of that, in that, that project was rather intensive because we were, there were three of us at the time just working full time on this massive project and designing custom pieces. I think at the end of it, we <clears throat> needed a little lateral uh, mind clearing. And uh, one of the things that we've been lucky enough to do is one of our friends uh, is a, uh, an artist by the name of Fritz Haig, who's a social practice artist in California who owns a, a, what had been, a, when he purchased it, a defunct commune in Northern California in Albion near Mendocino on the coast. Um, and we organized a, a group workshop residency of our, for ourselves and our friends to go out to this place, which is essentially a, a living arts community residency uh, called Salmon Creek Farm and live and work there for I think a week and a half. Uh, and we didn't know what we were gonna do. We just decided we were gonna go there and we know that there was work that needed to be done and we were gonna go there and we we're gonna figure it out. So Fritz and the space, uh, like I mentioned, is it's a series of cabins built by kind of back to the landers in the 70s and early 80s that have gone to pot a little bit, a little bit run down. So he's renovating them. And we were renovating part of the main cabin uh, on the property. That's the main dining cabin. And when we got there, we were rummaging around trying to figure out what we needed to do. And there's all this kind of debris and detritus around left over on the property from what people had done uh, and kind of left around in a state of disrepair. And we decided that we were gonna gather all of that up. And we knew that the deck was in need of a railing, uh, but we turned that into an opportunity to make uh, an installation piece out of found objects. Right, like the concept was that we would we'd create these zones. So I think there were eight of us, six of us. I should have counted on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we would have each have space to fill in and it, it became way more free form than that. And, and so we, we each pulled from all of the cabins surrounding all of these interesting objects like that. That was just a found object on this land. Um, yeah, and it was it, it, it again was is trying to make the space for something that didn't have to make money. And I and that, that is that's so important to creating good work, um, both good work that makes money and, and pays bills and, and work that feels good and feels successful in its own way. And this project in particular was really fulfilling in that um, the group of people worked so well together and we had a nice balance of jumping in freezing cold Northern California water and really working our butts off to make this all happen within a week. So is this really, there was nothing here um, when we arrived. And, uh, you know, that along those lines, you know, uh, as we maintain that at the same time we're showing you these images, there's all sorts of just more traditional work happening, renovations, additions, uh, retail spaces, but uh, we're always trying to pepper stuff in. So there's an invitation to a submittal for the Socrates Sculpture Garden in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and it was, we were basically coming up with some kind of odd sculpture that we would hope would be related to alternative uh, methodologies of production. And oh, in this one, it's basically like a, a stripped down version of different elements that you find on these weird back to the land spaces. So the kind of corn crib, solar shed, a PVC garden greenhouse, and then a batch heater at the far end in this garden space that hopefully people would come in and be able to like grow herbs in the garden. The solar powered corn crib would power a night light and then the batch water heater that's made a passive water heater would just be able to spray hot water out of it for the heck of it. So just like a meditation on different ways that people can create uh, what we in like urban settings take for granted as like utilities and ways to produce hot water and energy. But here's just a sculpturized version of that in a 
random sculpture garden in Brooklyn. It didn't, it didn't win, but it was fun <laughs> trying to, to go down the competition route. I feel like all these images we're showing are like all of our, our fun side projects, but that's what feels really good often. <laughs> um, so, so this piece on the right, that, that was, uh, we were asked by um, an organization in New York to, to send something for New York Design Week. We, we made this collaboration with a stone um, sculptor that we know. Um, we do side projects like cool collaborators postcards we send out to people. <laughs> so just thinking about community and collaboration and so much of our work. And then finally, kind of getting back more towards like traditional practice. This, uh, there's the image on the beginning you know, in our intro is the image that uh, this ultimately turned into. This was our concept goofy sketch for a project called The Nook. A, a, a local photographer uh, reached out to us and wanted a, uh, basically a cabin that was gonna be essentially a rental cabin. And as a rental cabin, you have the kind of added benefit of it being a place that people don't really have to live. So if you're in a place that is essentially a temporary playground for adults looking for a retreat, how can you make that a fun space? So, you know, this was a project that actually was a full new build. So this was our first real foray into architecture in more traditional sense. You know, behind this, there's a sense of really boring plan sections, elevations, foundation details, window schedule, et cetera. But uh, this one was the first time we got to put it all together. Um, so the owner was also the builder. So we worked with them to put this structure together and problem solve as we went along. But one of the main driving uh, desires from this client was that all the pieces that would go into it would be made from local artisans and crafters and that that would tell the story of essentially the area so that when you were in this space as many of the elements as you could would be elements that related to western north carolina specifically he was a little bit of a wood hoarder and he uh he would find logs on the side of the road and i'd help him go and mill them up with a, a wood miser and ultimately he wanted to have all these varied woods in the project because he wanted you to be able to, every wood that you experience in the space is something you can see out of the window. So it wouldn't be some exotic eBay from halfway around the world. It was all like this came from here or X amount of miles from here. And that was an important part of the storytelling. Uh, likewise, he also employed a lot of crafters in the area to, to, to make the pieces. So these are just interior shots. It's kind of like a playground where there's multiple levels and sleeping nooks and watching TV nooks and sofa nooks and a tea loft all in a 400 square foot space. So everything was all about trying to make compact, uh, hyper specific uses in a tiny space. So the image on the right is the dine, essentially the dining room, which is a uh, seating for two next to this big round oculus that looks out into the forest which is really beautiful and uh there he is actually on the left that's the owner builder i shouldn't even say that but he's just really getting into making his like hand hewn steps with a fro and a mallet uh that's on the top right is the, the gentleman who made all the staircase ladders in the space and then the woman on the bottom right is a uh, someone who worked in the textile trades craft world who made some of the throws that were in the space as well. So all the elements tell a part of the story of craft in Western North Carolina. Um, An another side project similar to the work we did in California at Salmon Creek Farm. Um, we got a group of friends together to essentially build a, a we, we were working on a cabin. We didn't quite make it. <laughs> Um, a, a tent platform, let's call it a tent platform in Costa Rica. And again, no running water, no electricity. Um, we really like to put ourselves through it, but it was just such an enjoyable experience to be on this beautiful um, land in the jungle making this, this thing together. And I, I think that's something that is a, a story that, that kind of uh, is, is like a line through our, our lives is, is projects like we just have a really hard time taking a, just a vacation. It would just be so nice to be somebody that took vacations, but we always like to intersperse that with um, work and working for others. 
Um, and then here we're back and like after that first nook, it started becoming getting more and more and more traditional projects. So this is just a concept design for what would become another uh, freestanding 900 square foot home, all open volume. Uh, so that's essentially a studio with areas that are carved out for specific uses. It's a bedroom, essentially loft upstairs, the kitchen with the fridge only goes in one place and one place only. And there's a secondary uh, sleeping loft that's halfway up a set of stairs, which is not shown, but just we started moving into more traditional architectural work, uh, which is providing a really interesting opportunity to work both as an interior studio, architecture studio, and to begin to reintroduce craft from local makers into spaces that we design the totality of. Um, and just kind of the last few images are more just projects that are recent that have come up. This is a, a recent project for a local vinyl manufacturer that just opened up during the pandemic in downtown Asheville in the old uh, uh, Citizen Times building our old newspaper, local newspaper has a, a big Art Deco building. That's a really wonderful space. And this has been turned into half of the space is a, a bar community gathering dining space with a record store and the other half of it is a actual, you can watch them pressing vinyl records on site, uh, which is really cool to see. But again, speaking to a different kind of craft, but craft again and showcasing that. Um, this project here, we're now back with East Fork as their brand has evolved and this is their second location in Atlanta. Um, and again, working with materials and shapes and designs that are emblematic of their brand. So solid ash counters, uh, natural plaster, and these very simply, but what we believe to be elegantly detailed cubbies that are, are lit to display the product, ultimately holding the space and kind of fading to the background to let the ceramics look as beautiful as they really are. Um, we worked with a local mill worker here in Asheville to, to build out all of these ideas. Um, and this pendant is uh, by an artist who makes her work out of mushrooms. So that is a pendant made out of mushrooms. So such so again, another like a beautiful organic material. You could literally throw this somewhere and it would it would just evaporate into the earth. And hopefully it's things like these, like the cash wrap that we designed here are are aesthetically pleasing enough and the material is solid ash that this, at the end of this life in this space, we'll find a new home with someone else somewhere. So um, I know we just have a few more minutes here so we can run through these last few projects, but um, this is a, a, a store here in Asheville called Garden Party. So an, another small project, this actually was a repurposed project too. They had another location and needed to move to a new space. So. We designed that first location. Yeah, we designed well. the first location. So we took all, a lot of those elements and, and used what we had to recreate this entire space. Um, we also worked on East Fork uh, Pottery's administrative offices. So they, they moved into a factory. Um, I think they have like 100 employees now, which is wild. When we met them, they had two employees. But um, they moved into this space and we, we designed out their entire administrative offices, which I think are 3,000 square feet. Um, so there are elements that were beautiful that we wanted to just keep, um, and then other other spaces where we fully redesigned the the entire layout of the space, and um, again using natural plaster and continuing their brand kind of physical aesthetics throughout all their locations. Um, a, a, a children's store um, in town called Playdate. Um, you know, using simple materials, low budget project, really fun, keeping it enjoyable for parents to shop in and um, making it enjoyable for children to be in as well. So this, this um, comes sort of full circle back to the Center for Craft, which was one of the first institutions we worked with here in Asheville, but they did a major renovation of their um, three, four story building in downtown Asheville. And they asked us to design a bunch of elements of that. So they asked us to design out this reading, um, this reading area. Um, so we were tasked with designing all the furniture um, and the layout and, used, um, and creating this lighting fixture. So 
we pulled together eight different textile artists from the region um, to come together and um, create this piece that we designed um, with a local fabricator who created the, the metal pieces and um, at Echo View Fiber Mill, which is a local fiber mill um, just north of Asheville. We dyed all of these threads um, with matter and goldenrod that we harvested. These threads are grown in Georgia and then they're woven in um, at Echo View Fiber Mill. So we, we had sort of a party pre-pandemic um, where all of these, these textile artists came together and tied all of these pieces on. Uh, and this is another element from that space in the downstairs lobby. The Center for Craft has part of their grant writing, uh, I guess, proposition is that the, whoever they write a grant to will write a, basically a dissertation that then becomes a, a bound book that goes into their research library. And in one corner or one room of their gallery, we were commissioned to make this large multifunctional uh, display and library furniture. So uh, to house these essentially dissertations as well as be able to be varied in the way that they present other material, ephemera, uh, et cetera, to, so that it can become a gallery and a library and that all of these pieces of furniture are designed in such a way that all of those shelf elements can come off and be reassembled in a variety of different ways. So the information can be presented as varied as they like. Um, and then these two elements are, this is the carrying that same language of these vertical slats, which became the element for uh, these similar thinking on a magazine rack in the upper uh, reading lounge, as well as a backdrop display for their reception area. Again, these are working with local fabricators, mill workers, furniture makers to develop furniture that is custom and ideally specific to the use and a, a fun way for us to explore new design. And then finally, kind of where we are now currently as a firm is where we're doing, we're branching more into new build architectural. So this is a project in Maryland that again, it's, it's specifically designed for temporary use. It's uh, another rental cabin that uh, these clients want uh, in a beautifully wooded lot up in Sharpsburg, uh, Maryland. So now we're really working more back towards where I, kind of I personally started doing, doing CAD design work, making plans, sections, elevations, schedules, and, and modeling to develop new things that will hopefully house all of the wonderful custom craft things that we can get into them. Uh, and then this is just another, just as a, 2000 something square foot new home that is on the boards in the studio, just a simple preliminary massing model uh, here in Asheville. Uh, and then finally, this is uh, another new build uh, 2100 square foot home for a family of four who had previously been living on a renovated 40 foot long school bus and traveling the country uh here in the area so this i think that at the end all, all our this all this kind of meandering through the small and the large the art practice and the architectural is ultimately it's all coming back to like homes and putting it all together into single spaces so the biggest project in our last project is that um, with a group of friends we recently um, purchased a, a bit of land so we're splitting 23 acres so each of us have about seven acres and um, we're starting the process of getting a road built and getting wells and electrical and it's a it's a long arduous and expensive process um, but the intention is for all of us to live there um, and be cool neighbors and um, right now to, to sort of like break bread or you know break break ground together we're building a, a tent platform all together um, and uh, that will have a little wood stove and safari tent so we can all stay there. So there's a way to be on the land in the process of getting the, the road built and the electrical and the well. Um, 
So really, like at the end of the day, I think it's, you know, as whether it's corny or not, the idea of it's the building, not the building is like this practice to us is building a life for ourselves. And we've spent a lot of time building it for other people. And which is also so which is the, uh, it's a gift and a very lucky thing to be able to do and to have access to do for people. But it's also, I think at any scale, there's always opportunity to use the design practice to build a life for yourself. So it's like set your foundations right, make sure you're in the comfortable spot. Don't, don't find yourself trapped in things that you don't want to be. And don't be afraid to do some things that seem like they don't make any sense because maybe that's where all the sense is. And you know, we're just about to embark on our own, hopefully wonderfully foolhardy and difficult and beautiful adventure of making a physical space for ourselves, however that shakes out. And it's, that's, that's the building, we're, we're, we're doing it. <laughs> so that's all, all right. we have. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking your time to hang with us and we're hope, happy to hear your questions. Thank you so much. Yes, if anybody has any questions, please use the um, Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, I just want to say this has been so inspiring. Um, just as a student, we kind of are put in the huge world of design and architecture, and it just was really inspiring to hear your story kind of both went down a bit of an untraditional path, and it's just really amazing to see where you are now and the amazing work um, that you've produced. So actually on that, we do have one uh, a question about do you have any advice or suggestions for students trying to figure out what they wanna do or what path they wanna go down um, and kind of how to navigate all of that? Sure, I, I mean, for me, something I wish I had done earlier on was um, just reach out to studios that I was really excited about and ask questions. A lot of people are really interested in talking and wanna help and um, just offer to buy somebody a cup of coffee and and ask whatever you can. Um, that that helps a lot, and that yeah, that helps. That can help. Um, that can help you find your way through yeah through the process. I mean, I think for me, I I I I didn't ask around enough, so I had to I had to kind of go through this whole process of going all the way through school and then moving to New York and just like getting into professional practice and wearing a little suit and working in Midtown. And then eventually I was like, oh, you can do it so many different ways. And I think like the first thing that I would say is be like, there's no wrong way to do it. Like, and there's, there really, there really isn't a wrong aesthetic either. I mean, you can like or not like things, that's fine, but it's like, you gotta do you. Mm -hmm. And I think the more opportunity you give yourself to see things that you get to see for yourself and find for yourself, like travel, explore weird stuff, go to the off-brand weird art shows, just like put yourself into uncomfortable spots. I think the more opportunity you have to like find something interesting that either pushes you back in the direction you might have been heading or opens you up to being like, oh man, like you can you can make this however you want. It's it's all made up. It's it's beautiful. It's all made up. It's no wrong way. Just just go. <laughs> so kind of um, on that topic, um, how important would you all say location is? And is being in Asheville? Do you think that's uh, changed a lot? Or how do you find other craftspeople in Asheville? Or how is it different than New York? Um, I think it just depends on the project. So obviously a lot of our work has been remote this past year. There's nothing like being in a space. If it's a, if it's a renovation or if it's a new build, there's nothing like feeling the volume of the space or feeling a site. So um, I don't think there's anything that can ever replace that or replace the face-to-face -face of being with somebody, someone. So um, it's changed a lot in some ways and then not in others. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's just, sorry. No, no. there's a variety of ways that that kind of shakes out. Cause I think that we were really like Asheville has been really good to us because there is a really strong craft tradition here. So there were people that we were able to connect with. And because of the culture of this place those people were actually excited and willing to share. In other places, it might just be that they're like, don't talk to me 
I'm doing this professionally. I don't take my trade secrets, but in others, it might be like, oh, that's great. You want to carry on a craft tradition. Let's talk. Um, so I think Asheville was really cool in that it allowed that. Um, but I also think that now in like showing my age or something, but like, I feel like online communities are a, a really interesting way for this stuff to connect. And I think that there are a lot of places that you can find camraderie and connection with people that are all over the place. And quite honestly, like when Which we, we first started, Instagram was really young. It wasn't the thing that it is today. Like people still just like went on road trips and took pictures and it wasn't necessarily for a brand yet. It was just like, you did that. And I think that that tool allowed us to connect to a lot of people because we'd see, we'd meet people who were like, we're traveling through and you can reach out and connect and be like, want to meet, see studios, find camaraderie, see what they're looking at. They look at what you're looking at. And I know that's just one thing, but I think that the digital platforms have a lot of ability to do that for people. I will say personally that like, I had to go to New York to work in a high stress environment to then step away and be like, oh, I've done that. I don't feel the need to do that necessarily ever again. That's not for everyone but that's what I needed to do to get to the place where I am currently. So it's, you know, a big, that kind of roundabout, I don't know answer, but I don't think it's the most important thing. And yeah, I don't think it's the most yeah. important thing, but it, it can help in certain situations. That, it certainly that, can. That huge project in Martha's Vineyard that were three houses, we, you know, we did almost all of that remotely. We had two site visits. Um, and then installed everything. So it's all it's all possible. You just have to have great people on the ground. Yeah, it's less about place and more about community. Yeah, so actually on that, um, we had a question about, um, do you find that most of your clients already appreciate regional craft before you begin working with them? Or is there a bit of convincing that needs to go on? And I'm kind of also wondering, do you think that things like Instagram or any like web sources, I guess, really influence people being able to find you and find your work no matter where they are and really feel connected to your work before they start working with you? Or is it something that gets established along the line? I think most people that come to us already have seen our work and know that we focus a lot on custom and crafted um, items. So there isn't always a, um, it's rare that we've had to talk people into it. Obviously budget is real. So, um, when, when people have that decision to make about how, where they put money, we we try to help them move it towards places where they will wanna hold onto objects for a long time. Um, yeah, and I, I think people have found us quite a bit through, through the internet. So it, I feel so grateful for that, that we can, you know, we can all find each other online. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, Jason, if you want to kind of ask your questions live real quick, I believe you have um, speaking abilities now. I saw you had some questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> you guys have shared your story and also your work. I found the work beautiful and scaling up in a really provocative and promising way. And I was wondering, you know, how much do you foreground the critique of the status quo and what you do? Which, which I think you are critiquing the status quo of, of, of practice and of making versus just the joy of, of making things on your own terms. I, I enjoy that, the tension of those two positions in, in what you shared. I wanted to hear more from you guys on that. Thanks, man. That's, that's a great question. And I mean, I think, you know, on a, on a cloudy day in the studio, there might be <laughs> some fire and brimstone critique of the way things feel like they are in the world and how that feels hard or detrimental culturally, environmentally, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that is definitely something that's part of my, just me as a person. Uh, but it's also not something that, it's definitely not something that the clients for the most part are bringing to the table uh, so I think it's a balance of being like, that's my internal battle to want to kind of like bring that 
to some extent or as much as I can into each project. But I think also, but like kind of presenting that and living that through the joy of being like, this is like, this is cool. This is fun. This is worth doing. And yes, all that stuff is right behind it. And I think is present and or tries to be present in a lot of it. Um, but it's almost like sustainable design. Like I lived in New York in the early 2000s and it was like greenwashing was a thing. And then there were, I found that there were people who were like, they were being sustainable design firms as best they could, but they weren't calling themselves that. They were just doing that work. That was like their internal thing, their struggle, and they were pushing forward, but they were able to do a lot of work that just, it just had that in there, but they weren't trying to, they weren't pushing that as the front narrative. So I kind of feel like that's a little bit about how at least I personally am trying to grapple with that idea of like, we're in this environment that has a lot of fraught things and in the world of design and interiors, how do you make a better environment for yourself and for others without it feeling like just too gloomy sometimes, right. you know, and like I'm someone who's prone to gloominess. So that's my own battle, but. Uh, right, I think it's it's easy to critique, but it's a, it's a different thing altogether to actually try to build the thing that you're looking for. And I, I don't think that we've been super successful at that, but I think that you have to focus on something that you're creating. But always critique. And always, <laughs> and always critique. Yeah. Never, but I think that's like, that's also the tension of us as people. Um, so yeah, I hope that maybe touched on it a little bit. A little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to ask a follow-up question. Sure. Which is really, you know, the last few projects that you showed shows the work scaling up and out. And I wonder about the discussion in the, in the studio relative to keeping the craft component and whether you guys are wrestling with the, the sort of a thread of losing that as your practice scales up, you know, and, and, and how you're relating to that. I think that's a common plight of many, many uh, firms as they, as they start to grow you know, the roles change within and so on. And I just wonder how conscious you are of that. You know, do you see it as an evolution? Do you see it as a, a, a kind of moment of threshold that if the scale of your work gets large enough that you can't afford to be, let's say, as involved as, as you appear to be, et cetera. I'm just curious about that, that as well. Uh, yeah. Nail head kind of like that. Yes, like that is absolutely like uh, front and center in our personal lives, professional lives. Cause like, you know, for us, our, our, there's not a lot of distinction between who we are as people and what we are as a practice. Cause it's always the core of like our relationship and it's grown. And I think that you're absolutely right. Like there does feel like there is a threshold in the way in which you start to fracture yourself with a variety of roles that you need to hold on to, to be able to manage yourself, multiple projects, other people invoicing, onboarding clients, working with subcontractors and all of that still feel jazzed about like, we're gonna make a crazy cool sculpture in this thing. Um, so I don't, we don't have an answer outside of this. I personally don't have an answer outside of just being like, you're absolutely right that that is, it's like, it's, it is front and center for us and scale is definitely, uh, the driving force for that because it feels you know we still have to make a we have to make a living and yet we also want to live good lives <laughs> and those those feel like they're at odds with each other um so at, at this particular moment because of what's happened with covid we've actually gotten really really busy which is pretty wild um it feels like it's kind of the right moment for deciding how that moves forward, which quite honestly don't have an answer for. We're figuring that out right now. But I think that that is something that everybody, like you say, everybody in every scale and every size goes through. And it's definitely a moment to remember and return to what it is that brought you here in the first place and put a check on how you feel about what you're doing to see if you're still doing what you showed up for 
uh, the first time you showed up to the studio. Um, so no answer, but you're absolutely right that it is a very, very, very real thing that is in the room with us right now, probably with everybody at the size. Yeah, and I think it always will be too. I think we'll always be going back and forth on whether we should get small, smaller or get bigger. It's great to work with other people. It's also great to work alone. So it's 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 just important that what whatever space we're in right now, we're we're feeling like we're actually showing up for it and being present for it, which can be really hard when you have you're you have a lot going on and a yeah. two year old. And a two year old. <laughs> and it's a giant time for like world cultural history to feel like personally feeling like something isn't working terribly well. A few things perhaps. Uh, how do you, in your way, in your profession, engage with that meaningfully and go forward? Which I definitely don't feel qualified to answer at this moment, but just know that it's like, it feels like a responsibility to be thinking on it. So we're working through it. Thank you. Yeah, of Thank course. You. Um, we have a question in the chat. So it says, could you elaborate more on how you think about the longevity of your projects, specifically those working with brands and their longevity? Sure. I mean, I, I'm just talking a bunch here. No, go ahead. I, I, I feel like the, like the, particularly with East Fork, you know, on a very rudimentary level, it's just like, could you disassemble a bunch of this thing and use it somewhere else? Like, that's one thing that feels like longevity of the project. Cause all things like, that's the thing about exhibitions, you know, it's basically going in the trash, which feels like morally complicated to be engaged with um, in the first place. Uh, but uh, with brands, you know, they have their own lifespan and it seems like that's got a rapidly increasing time frame or shortening, I guess. Um, so for us, it's like, how do you, how materially can you engage with the space, which is done in such a way that hopefully the thing lives beyond it and there isn't just like a crazy amount of embodied energy of like all marble from halfway across the world and it's OSB that if you get it wet, it goes in the garbage and at least there's like some material redeeming quality. But uh, it, you know, the hard part about this practice is it's ultimately not up to us what the longevity of these places are mm -hmm. you know we put a lot you put a lot of effort into trying to discern what it is that the brand is and wants and does and yes i think the physical spaces definitely help but uh you know in the kind of the same way like once you put something out there in the world the story isn't yours anymore it's like it's the brands and it's the way the customers are receiving it and who knows how long that lasts so I think the best thing that we've been able to do is just be really intentional with our design and material choices and detailing and try to be a little, a little mute while still being staid and sophisticated to hold that. And really just like we're on, we're on for the ride, like the brand might be as well. So it's, it's kind of out of our control, but you try your best to make a good project, I guess. And with custom work for brands, um, at least you can invest that or the brand can invest that money into local labor. Yeah. Um, whereas with uh, just purchasing furniture that's made elsewhere, that money is, is going somewhere else. So keeping it, keeping it in the community definitely feels um, like it contributes to, to a different kind of longevity. So actually kind of on that topic of like custom craft materials, things like that, um, what is something you would want interior architecture, architecture and landscape architecture to know about your work and work similar to yours? Oh boy. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a, a key takeaway type thing, um, something that you would maybe want to almost change in the world of architecture and design that is based off of your work or inspired by your work? Wow. Um, I mean, I think it's, it, it has to do with what your, what your entire talk series is about, which is, which is letting yourself not just focus on one way 
and getting stuck in that really allowing all of these different disciplines to enter and that that doesn't have to be just within the arts and all sorts of disciplines but um i think it, it can be a real trap for a lot of people and i hope that we can sidestep it to really get stuck in one way or one style or one one approach and um yeah i think that like having a looseness um is really is really key to feeling like fulfilled both professionally and personally yeah that's great <laughs> yeah i mean that i i think that's great so thank you so much um does anybody have any more questions they want to put in the q a or chat no okay well thank you again so much that was such an inspiring talk and i love seeing all of your projects as i'm sure everyone else did so thank you so much again for joining us tonight we really appreciate you being here with us through zoom of course um and thank you just thank you so much we really appreciate it and everyone make sure to tune on again tomorrow night at 6 30 for the lecture with peg um but thank you again have a great rest of your night thank, thank you so much thank for all us. of you really appreciate it all right go forth